you sure you don't want to let me in that trunk? Like, yeah, I'm quite sure. I'm not consenting to you going in the trunk. Okay. Calls up the canine unit. They're waiting like 20 minutes. Hey, listen, you know, it could be, I don't know how far, it could be hours. I don't want to keep you here. Just open the trunk and, and let me see what's in there. He says, no. The canine unit comes, handler comes there, uh, walks around the car once, twice, and... Time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we got new limited edition apparel. There's two designs, as with all the limited edition apparel. It's only while supplies last. This is the blue illusion tee, so I guess you can act like you're stronger than you really are. It's an illusion. And the other one, work harder, not lazier. Or you could just work really, really hard at being lazy. Doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is that you support the podcast. So hit the link in the description or go to EliteFTS.com and on the homepage, scroll down, you're going to see limited edition apparel. Click on there, pick up your limited edition apparel today. Help support the podcast, podcast, podcast. Thank you. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew. Would I join again? Absolutely. And I will continue to be a member of the Discord group as long as it's active. I've been a big fan of Table Talk over the last couple of years. It's one of my top podcasts that I listen to. So once Dave Tate announced that there would be a Discord crew. It was a no-brainer for me to join. It's been overwhelmingly positive experience. One of the biggest benefits of being in the Discord crew form checks. I work out in my garage by myself. I don't have people to cue me, to correct me, to coach me, anything like that. So being able to hop on the Discord post my videos and having elite top level power lifters and coaches able to give me real time feedback that, hey man, you need to tweak this, you need to work on this, do some more accessories here has been a huge, huge benefit. I've seen my progression as a lifter make jumps just because of that. There's so much info on the sport group for the members, thousands of articles, tons of eBooks. And really the best thing about it, it's like you're back in the gym, you're busting other people's balls sometimes. At the same time, you're getting really good information. It's been a blessing for me this last year and I really recommend it. All right, guys, back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Rick Collins, Esquire. I guess I would say you're a criminal defense attorney, yeah, right? That Regulatory lawyer. Yes. yes. Uh, and specializing in PEDs, the supplement industry, and so on. That's my gig. That's yes. your gig. All right. So we'll start with what's the significance of your hat? So um, this is a, the original OG hat, I think, from uh, when pro hormones were on the market many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. and there was a company named Ergofarm, which um, was one of the first to bring pro hormones, you know, the, the steroid molecule as a supplement ingredient to the market. So this is sort of a souvenir hat. Mm -hmm. I figured, you know what? I'm going to, I'll do my, my Bev's Gym uh, shirt, yeah. sweatshirt uh, to represent where I train and, and I'll go way, way back mm -hmm. to, uh, to the beginnings of my my involvement in the supplement industry with this hat as a yeah, souvenir hat. Yeah. That works. Uh, where I want to start is it's I've partaked, right, in the anabolic industry. Okay, have you really? right <laughs> since mm -hmm. yeah. since the eighties, right? Yes. So yeah. as it's it's interesting to me how things have shifted, you know, over that period of time because of regulatory issues sure. and, and so forth, where I think the way to kind of go over some of the history of this is to start there because I can comment on like how I was getting things and what those mm. things were. Mm -hmm. And then here's when it stopped. 
Right. And now I know why it stopped, but back right. then I didn't know why it stopped. Right. And it's also how you ended up becoming specializing in what you're in. Right. Now, we should put out there that your background before mm -hmm. being a lawyer was bodybuilding and yes. training yeah. and competitively. Sure. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't want people to think it's, it's a lawyer that's got no background in bodybuilding. Your background in bodybuilding is far extends yes. every, I would say almost everybody that's going to listen to this. So you started bodybuilding in high school, right? Or yes. training in high yeah. school. Yep. And then through college, you know, you fought the stereotype and doubled down on it. I did. And, you know, through that, which I cracked up when I heard that one, right? <laughs> because yeah. it's in law school, especially. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So how was that? So, uh, yeah, I certainly I was a bodybuilder long before I was a law student or, or a lawyer, uh, walking the walk, competing in, in NPC shows when, you know, back in. I guess the, you know, the very early 80s, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've sometimes posted on Instagram my NPC card mm -hmm. as it existed then, which, you know, looks nothing like like anything today. Um, but um, yeah, I went to law school. I, I, I was lucky. I, I did very well in college, uh, got very good grades, did well on my LSATs, and then um, got a free ride. So I went to law school for free, which for me was an important thing because I was not a rich kid by any stretch of the imagination. I, I would have gotten crushed in loans. And so be, because I was I was able to do it on a scholarship, um, I was able to ultimately take a job after law school as a prosecutor where mm -hmm. you don't get paid a lot, but it's great experience, great trial experience. But when I went to law school, I was back then there were very few bodybuilders in, you know, the law school or, or med school or any kind of the, the professions generally. And now it's it's different. Now mm -hmm. I get contacted by law students all the time who are like, oh, I love your career and I want to be a, a, you know, a bodybuilding lawyer and or both men, men yeah. and women. But back then, it was rare. And and like you say, you know, there, there are assumptions that get made about muscularity, you know, hypermuscular people. And I'd come out of training and, and, you know, competing at that time. So I was pretty jacked, you mm -hmm. know, and suddenly I show up at a law school and people are like, well, he can't have a brain, you know, yeah. he's going to fail. He'll never make it through the first year of law school. And, you know, and, and so dealing with those assumptions, you know, my, my gut was instead of trying to prove otherwise, um, I just doubled down. So I would show up at law school with, with my hat on backwards and the T Michael sweatshirt and <laughs> you know, underneath. the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> and your scoop nag, boat yeah, nag yeah. kind of thing. Baggy pants. Uh, all of it, all <laughs> of it. And so, um, so, but uh, I also made law review in my first year, and so, and, and they didn't realize I was one of the few there on a full academic scholarship. Um, but, but it was a, it was a fun experience. Uh, I went to work as a prosecutor afterwards, um, and that was sort of you know you've got your vocation and your avocation, right? So, mm -hmm. my bodybuilding was my passion. Bodybuilding was what I did separate from the legal career. Mm -hmm. um, and my legal career initially was as a prosecutor, putting the bad people mm -hmm. in, in prison. You know, I, I had seen enough superhero movies that I wanted to be like the crime fighter, yeah, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. So that was the closest that I could come to it. And, um, and I enjoyed it. I did that for five years. And then I went into private practice um, in 1990, initially doing, you know, the kind of work that most criminal defense lawyers do, representing people who did bad things to other people, hurt other people physically, economically, mm -hmm. sexually, whatever it was. And so I did a lot of that. And both as a DA, as an assistant DA, and as a criminal defense lawyer doing that kind of work, I tried a lot of cases. And you really do get experience that you would never get in private practice in the DA's office because you're given a five, the, your, your first week, here's your, here's your caseload. This case is on for trial on Monday. And, and whether it's in the beginning a traffic case or a misdemeanor and later felonies, you are handling, you're in court, you're making the arguments to a judge, you're thinking on your feet, you're standing mm -hmm. up. And and making arguments. And that is super important. Those so are the that's repetitions. the skill set yeah. you know, that, that you need. Um, I sometimes tell the story that um, the, the initial interview that I had to get the job as an assistant DA was you had to do an opening statement. 
and you prepare it. It was this fact pattern about this little old lady, Lillian Harrison, who uh, gets robbed on the street. And so, okay. So I prepared my little opening statement, no notes. You, you got to just stand up there. Mm -hmm. And it was a one-on-one, -on -one, just like you and me. Mm -hmm. And I come into the office and and the, um, the interviewer is sitting there, funny guy, good guy. I, I, became friends with him for many years after, and I'm still friends with him. And um, he said, well, have you prepared your opening statement? I'm like, well, yes. Okay, go ahead. So I'm standing up there and I start telling the story. The, the, the time is 7 p.m. The place is Main Street and Vine. Lillian Harrison, 64 years old, is on her way back from work. She's walking down the street northbound. As she's walking, passing a street lamp, she hears a sound. It's footsteps coming from behind her, at distant at first, but getting closer and closer. Suddenly, it's right behind her. She turns over her right shoulder to see the face of a man. This man, <laughs> this man, the defendant, David Tate, mm -hmm. as he reached for her pocketbook with his right hand and pulled it from her shoulder, knocking her to the floor. So I'm, I think I'm doing mm -hmm. great. Yeah, I'm doing, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, using yeah, my, yeah. and I was an actor mm -hmm. uh, at one time. And, and so I'm using all my acting skills. I'm making it passion. I'm, yeah. And in the middle of it, he says, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. It's getting a little hot in here. Can you open that window? So I look over and there's a, there's a window. It's probably about five feet wide. It's got two huge handles. I said, uh, okay. So I walk over to the window put my hands in the handles. I start to pull it. It's not moving. I pull it again. Not moving. He says to me, you know, you're a big guy. You should be able to open a window. So now I'm thinking I'm going to lose this job because I can't open a window. So I pull the window with everything I've got. I can't move it. He goes, all right, all right, all right. Sit down, sit down. So I sit down. He goes, all right. It says here that you used to work for uh, Dan, who is an ADA here, and that you were an intern in our office. I said, yeah. He goes, what do you think Dan would do if I were to call him right now and ask him about you? I, I said, I think he would, he would say that I worked hard. I was punctual. I, I did memos for him. I, I think he'd say good things. Okay, let's find out. So while I'm sitting there, dials the phone. He goes, yeah. Hey, Dan, it's Pat. Yeah, listen, I, got a, I just had a guy in here, Rick Collins. He just left. I think there's something wrong with him. He's a little bit off. Uh, wh what did you think of him? What? What? Women's clothes. <laughs> really? Okay, thanks. And he hangs up the phone and he just looks at me and he goes, women's clothes? Now, I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this is 1980 <laughs> or, or mm -hmm. 84, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, now I know I didn't open the window. Uh, I'm probably <laughs> losing this job at this point. And so I just go, yeah. He goes, when? I go, now. He starts laughing. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm shipping you off to a panel. And I got the job. <laughs> he wanted to see that I would roll with the vicissitudes of life. When you're in a courtroom, a judge can throw anything at you. Mm -hmm. you know, some of the arguments, the judge may not understand the law. The judge may yell at you for whatever reason. And if you're the kind of person who gets thrown in those situations, if you can't roll with it and think on your feet and come at, come around mm -hmm. it, if you get flustered and, and you're stammering, then you know trial work is not for you. Mm -hmm. If you can roll with the punches and 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 I did, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and he liked that. Yeah. You know, he saw that I was doing a good job with the, the, with the opening statement, mm -hmm. and so he didn't want to hear any more of that. He now wanted, and then of course I found out that window had been painted shut in 1941. <laughs> no one had ever opened that window. No mm -hmm. one will ever open that window. What did he wanted to kind of fluster yeah, me? He wanted test, to yeah. put me, yeah, he wanted yeah. to put the test. And that was a great test. Mm -hmm. And so um, you learn how to think on your feet, how to roll with the punches, both as a criminal defense lawyer and as a prosecutor. And when I went into practice in 1990, 
Talk about timing. Timing's everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in 1990, yeah, I, I did in the very beginning, I did a lot of cases I- involving things other than performance drugs and um, only because that's the way you start your, your practice. But 1990 was the year that Congress criminalized anabolic steroids. Yeah, And no, that see, was the year that I hung out my shingle. Yeah. See, that was the difference between where I would get things before mm-hmm. was pure pharmaceutical mm-hmm. from probably stolen from a pharmacy diverted or, diverted or diverted mm-hmm. from a pharmaceutical company 100 and then that abruptly stopped so right so then it came right. from mexico right right so yeah so c- congress in in the late 80s started to realize that athletes were abusing anabolic steroids and using them in in Sports that, you know, not bodybuilding, but, you know, uh, Olympic sports and, and even down to high school sports. So Congress started getting worried about that. And they held a bunch of hearings in the late nine, in the late 1980s. Um, and the, the catalyst for really when things got, you know, a lot of attention by Congress was the 1988 Seoul Olympics, where Ben Johnson, mm-hmm. the Canadian sprinter, uh, ran the 100 meters, set a world record, got the gold, beat Carl Lewis, the American sprinter, mm-hmm. and then tested positive for Winstrel. And the sports world went nuts. You know, what's going to happen to sports? Is this the end of natural abilities? Is this going to become a chemistry contest? And so Congress got very involved in figure, trying to figure out what to do about that. Mm-hmm. They held a bunch of hearings. Um, interestingly, and not many people remember this, but the FDA, the DEA, the American Medical Association, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse sent witnesses to testify at those hearings before Congress to say, no, do not schedule anabolic steroids. They don't belong in the same law with heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, opiates, all of that stuff. Congress decided not to listen to them uh, because they really wanted to do something to send a message Mm -hmm. uh, about cheating in sports. And so they put steroids into category three, schedule three of the Controlled Substances Act, and which suddenly gave the DEA the authority to go after things and gave a disincentive to the pharmaceutical industry to really produce the drugs, doctors to really prescribe the drugs, pharmacies to want to carry the drugs. And so you had all of the legitimate sources like you were talking Mm -hmm. about where, okay, yeah, there was a diversion problem. There was a diversion situation where FDA approved products were being diverted from medical use to the the folks Mm -hmm. who wanted to use anabolic steroids for either sports use or cosmetic use, Mm -hmm. which is really, as we know, the vast overwhelming yeah. majority of people are not competing in anything but pickleball, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. this is a, this is an aesthetic, you know, um, cosmetic drug mm-hmm. primarily. And so, um, suddenly you had a disinterest in making and prescribing and being involved with the, um, legitimate, chemicals, the legitimate FDA approved drugs. And what happens? You know, we learned in prohibition, right? Mm -hmm. When you no longer have a legitimate source of supply, a black market explodes. And so suddenly from the FDA approved meds that were used in the 80s, now we had different things appearing. So you had, for example, Mexican Mm -hmm. drugs, you know, from the pharmacias in Mexican, um, in Mexico, where you'd have pictures of horses or (laughs) or dogs Mm -hmm. or farm animals Mm -hmm. of different types, um, suggesting that these are veterinary drugs. But of course, they were being made for humans. Uh, They were being labeled for veterinary purposes because there might be lesser regulatory requirements or importation issues that might have to be dealt with. And so suddenly you had these bodybuilders using what appeared to be veterinary Veterinary drugs and the media picked up on that, of course. Um, and that became the market for a period of time, mm-hmm. this black market of drugs that were coming from overseas as finished products into yeah. the United States. Now, before that, what was the reason as to when it was being diverted, the product labels would have the little square on it that said this product, you know, will not enhance 
sport performance. Right. Yeah. So what was the yeah. catalyst to have that put on there? So the the uh, American College of Sports Medicine and some of the other medical groups in what I think they thought was a good idea to try to discourage people from using steroids in for non-medical purposes, mm -hmm. decided that they would try to sell the idea that steroids don't work, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you had some studies that were actually rigged in the 1980s <laughs> to show that they don't work. I mean, by, by giving, you know, like... 20 milligrams a yeah, week or something yeah. ridiculous and and then publicizing the results in a way to sort of engineer this public perception that they don't work um kind of backfired right mm -hmm. because when you tell people something that's obviously mm -hmm. not true and the guys in the in the trenches knew it wasn't mm -hmm. true suddenly you had a complete um lack of credibility on the part of the medical community and that that really created a, a a rift between the guys in the gym the guys in the trenches who were using anabolic steroids in the in the early 90s late 80s um and the medical community which seemed to be completely out of touch with reality yeah and and that that created a problem because obviously there are health risks mm -hmm. involved in the use of any drug you know you, you take a couple of aspirin your headache's going to go away you take two bottles of aspirin you go mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. right so you know the devil's in the dose very often and so um there's a difference between use and abuse but certainly those who abuse drugs can can have bad side effects and, mm -hmm. and i think that when the medical community started shopping the idea that steroids don't work to, to build muscle the their credibility was so diminished that people started to believe that everything that they were saying was not true including that there might be any health risks associated with it which is unfortunate yeah um and, and not a message that that should ever have been given but um but that's what happened to the market and answer yeah. your question and 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 the market adapts right as as government tries to regulate something if there's a demand there'll be a supply yeah economics 101 right and and i've, I've often said that there's a when we look at drug policy there's a certain percentage of the human genome that wants to get high and you can pass all the laws you want but the reality is that percentage is going to find a way they're going to have the demand for drugs and there are going to be those who will supply those drugs that's that's just mm -hmm. the reality and similarly there's a certain percentage of the hum human genome that wants to be jacked oh yeah and they are going to have that demand whatever laws you put in place and so if you regulate the legitimate source of diverted medicines, FDA approved medicines, well, then you have this Mexican pharmacia mm -hmm. market. If you then crack down on that, which they did in a number of uh, DEA operations like Gear Grinder, if you remember it back yeah. in the day. Well, that's what I was going to ask is what clamped down on that? Because eventually that became. Right disappeared yeah and then it had to it started coming i would from think there over. was probably some pressure on the, the the mexican government um i know they did raid in an operation called gear grinder they shut down a whole bunch of mexican labs so they they crushed it and mm -hmm. and plus um after especially after 9 11 there was a much higher scrutiny of what came into the country via airports etc yeah. and so finished product became much harder to get into the United States. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't get finished product in, then what happens? You know, yeah, you know the when, powders. So, so then the market shifted again, the demand and the supply. And so what the market now is, is, is of course, is, is uh, powders in a raw form coming from China or Asia, typically coming into the U.S. labeled as creatine or or some innocuous mm -hmm. uh, substance. Um, and if it gets through customs, then you've got a kitchen chemist in an underground lab capacity uh, creating a, a sterified injectable, or if he's got a, a pill press making making orals or whatever, and then selling it typically on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and hawking it that way. Um, but if you look at from a harm reduction standpoint, and harm reduction should probably be part of 
any drug policy, sure. maybe the the you know yeah. one of the most important parts of any drug policy. Yeah. So we went from as as you described, you know, FDA approved products in the 1980s, which were uh, made under quality control in clean rooms mm -hmm. in you know uh, drug manufacturing uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, facilities, to now. A raw powder that shows up and somebody in their kitchen is is making it under who knows what quality control circumstances. And now it's going out and being sold over the Internet to people of all ages, including people under 18 um, and being used without medical supervision or monitoring. Um, and I've represented a lot of a lot of underground labs in, mm -hmm. in you know, over the years. Um, and some uh, of the uh, guys are unbelievably fastidious and meticulous about the quality control of their products but some are not yeah you know and and some when you 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 look at the uh dea video of the crime scene <laughs> yeah of where it was being made and you see where the cat was walking over you know things that people are injecting into their bodies and you know some maybe the the dosages may or may not be um what they purport to be you know, you're thinking well somebody's injecting this and and the same would be true of of even some of the other from SARMs and, and some of the yeah. other things that are on the market as well um You've, you've escalated the risks, you've escalated the harms by crack, by the crackdown policies on the legitimate sources of supply. So I've been somewhat, I'm not a, I think we're, we're reaching a point now in terms of drug policy where we're beginning to realize that the war on drugs probably didn't work very well yeah. in, in any respect. And, and so we're, we're scaling that back in many ways, at least with respect to heroin and cocaine, maybe in some ways in some ways inappropriately mm -hmm. maybe we shouldn't be uh giving people free market open air places where they can inject uh, as much heroin as they yeah. want and then wander the streets uh maybe maybe we've gone too far in terms of tolerance and and um um allowing or maybe even encouraging people to continue drug use but with respect to steroids we really we're really not you know looking at minimizing those harms in in any way shape or form typically i you know there was there's only been one um movement to deschedule testosterone out of the anabolic steroid control act and and when i say the control act that law passed in 1990 um it was limited to 27 different compounds. It didn't really cover a lot of the pro-hormones that were coming out into the market. And so in 2004, it was amended to include a whole bunch more andro and, and other mm -hmm. type of products that were on the market. And even that was a fail. So Congress you know, doesn't get sometimes the best advice on yeah. how to make a law, um, especially in this kind of very uh, niche area. And so in 2014, they took a third stab at it. And that was the law, the design of Anabolic Steroid Control Act that really is, is the law that exists now and really did decimate the market for pro-hormones, for, mm -hmm. for uh, steroids being called supplements and hitting the market that way. Now, after 9-11, was it <laughs> the supply hit because the government could now search any package with for any reason, whereas before they couldn't do that. So um, one of the things that people should know is that you have privacy in a mailed package. So if I mail Dave Tate a package, the government can't open that in the, the U.S. Post, in the U.S. In the U.S. domestically, yes, yes, yeah, they can't without a search warrant. Yeah, they get a search warrant, they can open it up. Mm -hmm. They've got a reason. They go to a judge. They say they have probable cause, which is the basis for that. Now, international mail is different. Mm -hmm. So if I mail Dave Tate a package from Greece. Now it's similar to walking across the border or appearing at an airport and going through. Look, you know, you go through the scanner, they can randomly say, you know what, put your hands out. We're going to scan you. We're going to. So uh, there's very little protection at international borders. And so that is the same logic 
that allows them to search a package, an international package, without a warrant. So I think you know th that was all that was the law prior to 9/11. Mm -hmm. um, but I think 9/11 just made it so much uh, more important to the government to really think about what's coming into the country. And so you have scanners that are checking, you know, so they see a bunch of vials in a in a package coming from Thailand or, or Greece, and um, they're not stupid. Yeah. So th they kind of know what it is. Some of them get through because I, I, you know, but, but some of them don't. And if they don't, well, then the government has a, a menu of choices of what to do about that. Right. So I've, I've now, let's say I'm, I'm working in an airport and I've now got a package with a hundred 10 cc vials of what appear to be anabolic steroids. So maybe I call up the FDA or the DEA and I say, you got to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. and maybe they test it and they find out, yeah, these are, you know, it's, it's testosterone cypionate. So, so now what do we do? Well, it's a hundred vials. So, so what do we do? Well, maybe the DEA says, well, we'll, we'll do a controlled delivery of this. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they get, they dress somebody up as a, a mm -hmm. mail carrier uh, under the supervision and surveillance of other agents and they knock on the door and the guy comes and they say, here's your package. And once he takes it into the house, well, that triggers mm -hmm. the uh, execution of a search warrant. Uh, sometimes the package is actually wired so that when he opens mm -hmm. it, 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 it sends an alert to the agents. And suddenly there's 20 agents swarming the guy's house, taking uh, anything that might be evidence of the crime. So that would include his computer or other electronics that might show that he ordered it and his communications with the source. Uh, it could, I've seen them seize bodybuilding magazines, you know, mm -hmm. as, as part of the evidence to show that he's not just, an, he just didn't happen to receive a, a prank package, that he's a person who is more likely to have been intending to receive it. Yeah. And so that's, that's one way, but they don't always do that. Sometimes they send out a seizure letter, mm -hmm. uh, which is simply a letter saying, Hey, uh, we've got your, your mm -hmm. steroids and, and we don't think Think you should have them, but if you've got a good reason for it, let us know. Yeah. Contact us, and we'll be happy to talk to you about your steroids. And it'll say, typically, if we don't hear from you in a set period of time, we're going to destroy it. And most people just ignore that. Yeah. And so, but they get put into a database so that their address and their name and other indications of who they are uh, are in the customs database. And so if it flags that more packages are showing up, at some point, maybe they'll go to that, that other route. Yeah, I've known people that have had both happen. You know, right, and sure. I know other people to where, you know, it's, it's kind of common knowledge that if the package is delivered, you just don't do anything. Mm -hmm. You just hopefully just let it sit on the step. Right. Wait a few days. Right. And then right. take the <laughs> yes. risk for it. Right. Yeah. But they don't won't, answer you the door. You try to wait them out. You yeah. Know? Don't yeah. answer the door. Yeah. And then if, if you are dumb enough to answer the door, don't let them in. Right. You know, they, they need a warrant, right. you know, just basic stuff like yeah. that. But yeah. the people that I know get that would get busted would be the ones that would get the letter. Right. And never understood this, by the way. And then be dumb enough to go pick it up it's like <laughs> right, are you yeah. kidding yeah, me yeah you yeah. know but they had so much invested right you know that they thought that was worth right. that risk and it's just kind of ridiculous well if, if in the situation if they really want you and, and in the situation where you try to wait them out they'll sometimes then just do what's called a knock and talk where mm -hmm. you know okay you didn't pick up the package it's still sitting there or whatever uh here we are mm -hmm. we're from the dea we know what you ordered. We know what you're doing. Um, we want to talk about it. You can choose not to talk to us, but then we're going to continue to investigate this case. If you want to sit down and talk with us, we know what you did. We know you ordered it. Uh, talk to us. And then if somebody does, well, that's how they build the case. So my recommendation, and, and it's the recommendation that any criminal defense lawyer would make is, number one, unless agents have a warrant to enter your house, you have no obligation to let them in. And it's always okay to just say, do you have a warrant? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call my lawyer. He'll talk to, you know, he'll, he'll talk to you. Uh, but he's told me that, um, without a warrant, you can't come in. Okay. So I don't consent to you mm -hmm. coming in. And the same would be true. I've, I've had situations and we could, we could talk about some, some examples of cases yeah. I've had, you know, at, at some point, but, um, 
if they if the police stop you and they say, you know, uh, where are you going, Mr. Tate, and you mind if we take a look in your trunk? Um, you have every right to say, I have nothing uh, problematic, but I don't consent. I choose not to consent. That's the advice of my lawyer. Uh, and then they'd have to get a warrant to, mm -hmm. to, to move forward. So uh, you certainly don't have to consent to that. And secondly, um, you don't have to answer any questions. You don't have to, well, did you order a package? You, you know, you don't have to answer that, yes or no. Um, and answering it either way is problematic. So if they ask you questions saying, did you answer, did, did you order steroids? Are you involved with steroids? Is, is this your package? And you say, no, 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 no. Well, if that's not true, you're lying. And you're lying to federal agents in the capacity mm -hmm. of their employment. What does that mean? That's what's called a 1001 violation. And that's what Martha Stewart went to jail for. Mm -hmm. You can't lie to federal agents. You have to tell them the truth. If you ask, you don't have to answer questions, but if you choose to answer the questions, they better be honest answers. So lying and, and denying a crime uh, can get you in trouble just if it's not true, right? And and saying, yes, I did order it. And yes, I've, I've yeah, but it was my first time, whatever. Well, all of that is going to be written down and all mm -hmm. of that is going to be used. And I've seen people by answering questions, walk themselves into a case against themselves that never would have existed because there wasn't sufficient evidence for probable cause until the person opened their mouth. And one of the most devastating pieces of evidence in a criminal case against somebody is their own words. If you make a confession, and, and the confession may, you, you may not even realize the significance of the confession. They may ask you questions which supplement other information they have that then gives them probable mm -hmm. cause. So bottom line is you have every right to say, I'm happy to speak with you, but I need to do it with my lawyer. And we'll, you know, I have a lawyer. He's told me he'll handle these things. Give me your business card. Give me your phone number. He'll be more than happy. I'm, I'll be perfectly cooperative. And then let the lawyer handle it. Um, I've had clients who, you know, ask me for my card in advance just in case something would ever mm -hmm. happen. And they've actually put it through the little screen, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the opening in the screen of their door so as not to let them in. Because obviously they'll say, listen, you know, we're, we're here. We want to talk. Um, cold out here. Your neighbors are watching. Why don't you just let us come in and we can sit down inside? Of course, once you let them in, they're going to be scanning the room for anything that might give them probable cause mm -hmm. to arrest yeah. you, right? So it, it be, you're, you're on that slippery slope to a case against yourself. So you know, don't consent to warrantless searches. Always ask for a lawyer, mention a lawyer, and don't answer any questions either by admitting or denying because both of those are problematic. So that's, that's you know, legal recommendations mm -hmm. 101 for, yeah. for everybody. And it applies not just to steroid cases, but really to, to any case where you're concerned that y you may have a problem. You know, I can remember, I mean, probably going back 20 years now where there would be knocks on doors without packages just because they were on some list and all they're really doing is trying to fish for who they got it from. Right. And that that's kind of how you could always figure out right. who, who ratted who out. Yes. Because you could track that trail back. Right. But the, the, the trick was never get on the list in the first place. Sure. That was the first thing. Yeah. And then um, to not say anything, you know, it's the same thing, but they, right. they're tricky. You sure. know, they, they can be really, really tricky. And I yeah. think that's where a lot of these guys would slip up. Yes. You know, is they say no, they, they would just, they would dig a hole for themselves. Right. And then end up on probation for five years for absolutely nothing. For something stupid. Because they never yeah. came in and got anything. Right. You know, which is right. a mind blowing thing to, that was back then it's, <clears throat> from my perspective, it was more personal use cases. Right. People were getting hit for that. Right. And if I'm being completely transparent, it usually came from somebody sold something to a high school kid that got to their parents. The parents get sure. pissed off, call the police station. They have no choice at that right. point. Right. Even if they don't care, which they probably don't. Yeah. But they do then. Right. Right. Because. You and know, that's that's the reality. Yeah, a parent just called. They can't ignore that. Yes. And then that leads Once to it's that. in their face. You know, I, I don't think you know, there was a time earlier um in in my handling of these cases where I did see more 
common personal use arrests. Yeah. There was a time when that went on. Um, and I've dealt with a lot of cases where, I mean, back in the day when finished products were coming in, um, somebody orders a tub of the Tyanabol, something yeah. like that back in the day, and there's a thousand tabs in the tub, and suddenly it appears at an international airport. And back then they're looking at this like, wow, this is like a thousand tabs of ecstasy. This, mm -hmm. is, a, this is a serious case. We got a big time dealer. And so this guy who, who really was, it was the minimum amount that he could have ordered mm -hmm. from the from the Thai source. And suddenly this guy who's, it's a purely personal use scenario. And and you know that- They're that stocking they're, up. Yeah, they're yeah. pack rats, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're, you want enough for a few cycles if mm -hmm. you're going to get it. And then you get a better price that way too. So suddenly this guy who just wanted a better price and wanted enough for his personal use cycles is suddenly being deemed a, a dealer of like a you know, thousand tabs is, is crazy. And so I would wind up getting involved in those cases either because the client would call me or because a lawyer would call me and, mm -hmm. and say, we need to get you into this case. Would you work with us on this case to educate the judge and the prosecutor and the agents that no, this is not like a thousand tabs of ecstasy. You know, guys are taking, you know, 10 pills a day and this is just a couple of cycles. So I did a lot of that mm -hmm. work uh, for a period of time. I don't see those anymore. I think now, like you say, there's usually a catalyst for it, whether it's, you know, the, 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 the kid who his mom calls and says, mm -hmm. here's the steroids. I've seen where the boyfriend is caught uh, stepping out on the girlfriend and the girlfriend mm -hmm. calls the uh, police and says, I've, I've got his treasure trove mm -hmm. of anabolics here, that rat bastard, this is what he, and suddenly they come and they, they're faced with all these steroids. Um, I, I've seen even situations where the guy's come back, you know, for whatever reason he has it, he gets stopped for a traffic infraction and it's sitting on the seat, <laughs> you know? So if it's right there, Yes, um, the agents do. There are occasional cases where they they go after bigger steroid traffickers. Um, it happens, but um, they're they're fewer and far between. I wind up probably getting most of those cases nationwide. And I, mm -hmm. I was figuring the other day that I think I've practiced law or advocated in in steroid or other cases in in forty one different federal courthouses across the country. Um, I, I've been from coast to coast, north to south, east to west. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a record, but it's probably yeah. not too far from it. Uh, all within my sort of niche, because there really are no other lawyers who do this kind of work, and I'm passionate about mm -hmm. it, and I'm knowledgeable about it, and my clients, you know, often become my social media followers and friends yeah. uh, through the years who want to see what my journey is and and be, and be part of that. Um, you know, I, I'm probably one of the few criminal defense lawyers in the country who doesn't typically. Have have to represent anybody who has economically, physically, or sexually harmed another human being. It's typically just people who are dealing gear or involved in some way. Obviously, I represent athletes in in cases where they're accused of violating sports rules. Mm -hmm. I represent a lot of uh, police officers and others if they get a um, a steroid test or or a you know sometimes some police departments are doing steroid testing. And sometimes they test not for anabolics alone, but also for the other things that you would be tested for in a sports doping case. So I had a, a guy a few years ago, a, um, a cop who tested positive for clenbuterol, uh, and they wanted to take away his job, his pension. Yeah, his whole life was collapsing. This guy was on the job for like 13 years, a good mm -hmm. cop. He wasn't, no instances of excessive force. He wasn't a, a big, you know, maniac by any stretch of the imagination. He was a, just a nice guy. Um, and suddenly I remember speaking to the, to the prosecutor and, and saying to her, you know, this is not a steroid. This is clenbuterol. This is a beta two agonist. Agonist. This is a bronchodilator that's permissible in other in mm -hmm. other countries. We have albuterol in this country, but but you know, this is at most it's a stimulant. You know, it, it's it's not it's not associated with roid rage yeah. or aggressiveness or any of the things that you may think would underlie this policy. And her response was, "Well, we have a zero tolerance policy." I said, "Okay." Zero tolerance for anabolic steroids. Yes. 
this isn't anabolic steroids, I know, but we have a zero tolerance policy. So it was this circular, crazy conversation. I wound up trying the case. I spent a week in the trial room um, calling in witnesses. They called the architect of the major league um, baseball uh, doping program. I called a, a witness from California. We had experts. It was this crazy battle. And I, at the end of the day, I won and he was reinstated. He got his back pay. He got his pension back. He got his job back. And I think he even sued the department but for for what they mm -hmm. did to him but um but you sometimes you're you're dealing sometimes with prosecutors or others who uh, as well meaning as they may be uh, just aren't getting it and so uh, I'm kind of the guy who who sometimes get bro gets brought in to to work in those cases mm -hmm. how have the counts changed over the years you talk about the you know 1000 Thai D ball right so at one point in time, wasn't it 50 were one count? Yes. You remember and, that? Yeah. You remember those days? Yeah. <laughs> and now it's like, is it one count per? So um, the way that in in just a, an overview, yeah. in federal cases, there's something called the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, and they advise judges on how much prison time should be advisory toward a particular crime. And for steroid cases, like other drugs, it's the quantity of drugs that that forms sort of the base offense level. There can be enhancements above and below for other factors and circumstances, but the base offense level is where you start. And so the more units of steroids, the more prison time you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So the, the unit is an important, an important thing. So prior to 2006, a unit of steroids was defined uh, as in, in terms of injectable liquids. Um, it was basically a 10 cc vial was one unit. Yeah. And 50 tablets, so tyannable, mm -hmm. was one unit. Okay. So when you really do the math of 50 and, and the vials, you, you needed a lot of steroids to be looking at any substantial prison time, admittedly. Mm -hmm. And so the Guidelines Commission started to look at whether that needed to be increased because DEA was saying, we need, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to prison for you know a boatload of steroids and they're getting probation. And I was brought in as the consultant and, and expert by the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers to help educate the commission on some of these issues. So I went to Washington and I, you know, they were trying to actually remove the cap right, you know, at the time the cap was 40,000 units and, you you know, whether it was 40, 41,000 units or 4 million units, it was capped out at yeah. a level 20. They wanted to remove that cap, which would have mean, meant if you had 80,000, you'd be way, way higher. I advocated not to for a whole lot of reasons, including steroids are, are, are used by pack rats. And mm -hmm. so the, the quantities that they use aren't the same. You can't treat it like different schedule three drugs because you know it's different if you're using it for psychoactive purposes and you're using it for physical purposes. And steroids are the only drug in the entire Controlled Substances Act that are not typically taken for a psychoactive effect. You're not looking to get high. You're not looking to stimulate yourself, depress yourself, uh, have, have hallucinations. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're, you're you're looking to get jacked. You're looking mm. to build some muscle and maybe get a, a six pack for you know the summer and you know uh, on the beach. Mm -hmm. So um, as a practical matter, you can't treat it the same. And I was able to keep that. You know, they they listened and did not increase the cap um, with respect to steroid you know, with steroid yeah. uh, charges, but. Um, they did change the computation because it, their position was that you know, nobody could ever go to prison under the old law and under the old you know model. And so what they did was they made it 0.5, so a half of a milliliter became a unit. So that 10 cc vial was now 20 units. So big difference, right? A 20 fold yeah. increase in the calculation of the dose of the unit. And instead of the 50 tablets, it's one tablet. So you had a 50-fold change. So if you do the, the math in a, you know, a higher level of you know, quantity, um, 
there was a profound difference. So then so, anybody is at a 20 count. So pretty much any trafficker, yeah. any, you know, so, and, and they now, they actually included uh, the powder potential because they were made aware that obviously some of this, so it's uh, 25 milligrams typically was sort of the guide for powder. So if you do that math, if you've got basically a kilo and a half of powder, sip, whatever, that would be the max, that would max you out at the level 20 in the guidelines. So whether you have a kilo and a half or 500 kilos, you're at level 20. Mm -hmm. So now, Will a judge take the, the 500 kilos into account in sentencing you as maybe a way of, of treating you above the guidelines? Sure. Mm -hmm. And there are arguments and, and that's what, you know, there are arguments in sentencing between the defense counsel and the prosecutor that can be very substantial. I've done here essentially ster steroid sentencing hearings where you're even calling witnesses to determine how the guidelines should be applied to a particular case. So even in, even in a situation where somebody's convicted after trial or they take a plea, you can still wind up in heavy litigation as to what is the appropriate sentence. And a sentence should be you know, sufficient, but not greater than necessary for the interests of justice. And that's one of the arguments that I make, you know, what is a sufficiently, you know, what, what's a sufficient sentence for this case? Do we have to really punish them? And I've been very successful in getting non-guideline sentences, sentences below the the ster whatever the the applicable guideline mm -hmm. is. So let's say the guideline for a for a level twenty, you, you go up and down with different enhancements, but maybe you're at around let's say you're at three years, somewhere around thirty to thirty seven months or something like that. You know, my argument is to to try to get less than that, to try to maybe get some sort of home detention or something along those lines. And I've been able to do that even on those kind of guideline cases for I've got my bag of tricks that I apply mm -hmm. and you know all the all the machinations and magic that I try to do in these cases. Um, and you know, it's funny, I've had cases all over the country. And uh, sometimes it, it's unexpected the way cases can go when you when you deal with some of these guideline issues. So I, I had a case in in Dallas a few years ago, and um, I was called in. There were two local Dallas lawyers who were already on the case, and it was a it was a combination case really because it was a, a guy who ran health food stores and he was selling pro hormones. Which you know at that time you know were were arguably not under the definition of an anabolic steroid. At least that was my mm -hmm. certainly my argument. I think I was right, and um, and he was also dealing some steroids as well, but in much smaller quantities from sort of under the counter kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the prosecutor was putting all of that together for the purposes of the guideline calculation in units, which was very high. My argument was you're wildly overestimating what the guideline, the applicable guideline is because all of these other things are not within the drug definition of an anabolic steroid. So we, so that was my argument. So um, the prosecutor was a very smart guy. Um, and he wa he was looking for eight years for this guy, eight years. And the local two Dallas guys were looking for a three year sentence. And none of them really understood any of this. They were, you know, they were not well informed. And so I was brought in first as sort of the the outside consultant guy. And then when I started to realize and the client realized that I, I had maybe a better grasp on on things, suddenly I was like the lead guy mm -hmm. in the case. And so it was kind of me against the prosecutor. And, and the prosecutor, interestingly, was a, a, a DC guy and smart guy. Um, it didn't really jibe well with the local Dallas guys, you know, uh, had a different vibe to him. And I'm, I'm a New York East Coast mm -hmm. guy. We actually kind of hit it off. And, and so I enjoyed the, the chess match with him. We sparred back and forth and he kept trying to come up with ways that the client would go to prison. Yeah. And I kept trying to come up with ways where he wouldn't go to prison. And so we went back and forth. And I remember one time he called me on the phone and he came up with this theory by which which prison would be applicable and, and appropriate. And I said to him, you know what? I've been doing this a long time. And 
That is the most creative and brilliant <laughs> argument that I have ever heard from a prosecutor in a steroid case. I am so unbelievably impressed. I mean this sincerely. You're wrong. You're mm -hmm, wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's brilliant. Well, why am I wrong? Well, you're wrong because, and I stated, mm -hmm. you know, so ultimately we wound up calling like the U.S. Sentencing Hotline Commission in Washington and presenting this, you know, get, getting an advisory ruling on how the guidelines applied. And ultimately I was told, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're right. And and he said to me, Look, what are you looking for in this? I said, I'm looking for probation. He said, done. Mm -hmm. And the guy got probation. Mm -hmm. And um uh, I'm still friends with his family. Um, you know, a lot of my my clients and their families ultimately become friends, you know, because you're really helping somebody out in these cases, somebody who has no real criminal record. Uh, most of my clients don't have any criminal record or, or not really a drunk driving, maybe mm -hmm. at most, at worst. And so these are people, this is like the worst thing that's ever happened to them in their lives. This is like a cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. and I'm the oncologist who's coming in and I've cured their cancer and it's just a a, a a wonderful thing. I, I'm so blessed and, and passionate about what I do. I love what I do. Um, I can't see myself ever retiring because I, I enjoy it too much. But you know, that's that's sort of like an, an example of really making a huge difference in somebody's life. And, yeah. and had I not been there, you know, with my unique little weird set of skills, um, it, it wouldn't have gone that way. And and and, and I've had lots of cases like that all, all over the country. Um, just love loving what I do. How have the cases changed over the years? Um, so uh, I don't think that uh, you know they vary. I don't think that the the personal users are really under fire like they used to be. Obviously, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that anybody yeah, go out yeah, and possess yeah. gear, you know. Well, you're not giving legal advice either, so well, we should yeah. put that out there. Yeah, I always say, you know, not that, <laughs> don't construe anything I'm saying as legal advice yeah. or medical advice. Uh, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, yeah. at least not yet. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so none of this is legal advice. But, but certainly, look, you know... Um, there's always a chance that that anybody's going to be uh, arrested and you know you are doing something that's in violation of the law and you know if you have a problem you can always call me um my office line is open 24 7 and and i i travel all over the country um a couple of years ago uh, i had a case uh, where a woman called me. She was a, a female bodybuilder, you know, high ranking amateur bodybuilder, um, jacked, super jacked. And she called me from a Western state and she said, Rick, I, I need your help. I said, okay, well, what's going on? Well, I'm accused of selling one vial of testosterone to an undercover snitch, an undercover informant in, in my gym, in my little training facility, my studio gym, in this small little town that she lived in. And I didn't do it. I, I did not sell him anything. He's lying. And I need you to, to help me. So I said, okay. So I, I call up the prosecutor on the case. So this is a state court case. And I've handled many state court cases as well. Um, I'll bring in a local counsel typically, who, who knows the judge and knows the prosecutor, sort of the home cooking mm -hmm. uh, rather than just some guy from New York doing it. But, but you know, I'm, I'm the guy with the knowledge that, you know, the, that you know, needs to be part of the case. And so I call up the prosecutor and, and I say, what's, what's up with this? He's like, well, uh, she may say she didn't do it, but it's an open and shut case. I've got her dead to rights. Okay. So we have an undercover informant who's, you know, who knows steroids because he's working off his own steroid uh, case. He's been charged with steroids. Um, and he called her up and talked to her on the phone about having her give him training lessons and a diet. And then he asked her about anabolic steroids. And she said, if you come into the gym tomorrow, I will sell you a bottle of multivitamins. And inside, I will insert a 10 cc vial of testosterone. And I will charge you $100 when you come to the gym tomorrow. So, he then calls up the agent that he's working with and the, you know, the local cop and tells about this conversation. It's not recorded because mm -hmm. he just, it was a cold call. 
So the agent meets him the next day. The agent um, does a pat down of him a few blocks away from her gym, uh, gives him the money, gives him $100, um, and puts a wire on him so that the there'd be an audio recording of what happens. And he then drives his car the few blocks, parks in front of the gym, walks into the gym, has a conversation with her. They go into her private area, a um, little private room. And there's a conversation about training and about diet. And at some point, he asks about steroids. And she says something, because I, I hear the tape, uh, well, um, steroids are part of competition at the elite level, but I don't recommend them for everybody. To which he says, well, do you have that bottle of multivitamins that we talked about yesterday? And she goes, oh, yeah, of course. And so they go out and a transaction occurs at the counter. He then goes back to his car. He drives over to where the agent is waiting, gets out of the car, gives the agent the bottle of vitamins. Agent opens it up. You know what's inside? 10 cc vial of testosterone. So, wow, just like he said it would happen, right? And so a couple of weeks later, they appear at her house with a search warrant, and they find anabolic steroids in the bedroom in one of the um, nightstands. It's actually on her husband's side of the nightstand, but they find steroids there. And so the prosecutor says to me, in this state, we have what's called a three strikes and you're out law. What that means is the first strike was that drug conversation, the cold call. The second strike was the actual transaction the following day. The third strike was the recovery of the anabolic steroids in her home. Those three strikes give her a 10-year exposure. She's looking at 10 years in prison if she goes to trial and she loses. Now, I'm willing to give her probation. I'll give her probation. I'm not looking to screw her life up, but she's got to plead guilty and she's got to admit what she did. And then she won't get the 10 years. But if you if she doesn't, we'll try this case and she's going to get 10 years if she's convicted. So I call her back and I explain what he told me. And she says, I don't care what he says. I will go to jail for 50 years. I am not pleading guilty. I am not pleading guilty because I did not do this. So you're in that situation now as a defense lawyer. You know, she didn't have a huge amount of money and, you know, but I believed in her mm -hmm. uh, and I, I didn't like what was going on. And so I wound up, you know, getting the copy of the tape. And there are two things that that you can use as a criminal defense lawyer. One is you get discovery. So you're able to to hear the audio tape. So, so and I listened to it. I had my my office uh, personnel listen to it because I wanted to make sure that what I was hearing was yeah. what everybody else was hearing. And the second thing is, in that particular jurisdiction, you were able to do a deposition before you could depose the witnesses in a case. That doesn't happen in many states. Most states don't allow that. So that is, so I want to depose the cop and the snitch. I want to talk to them in advance of the trial so I can see, all right, you know, let me hear what they have to say before I make the decision of whether I want to roll the dice on a 10-year sentence for this woman, mm -hmm. right? No prior criminal history. And she was saying, you know, look, why would I sell steroids? This is a, this is like a studio gym. I have business people here. I'm not, this isn't a meathead gym. You know, yeah, sure. I, I'm, you know, I, I compete in, in what I do, but uh, I would never sell a steroid. So one thing leads to another. I jump on a plane. I fly out there. I wound up driving two, three hours up into the mountains to this little tiny town where I think Wyatt Earp was once the sheriff, <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, and we come in and I got a local criminal defense lawyer to be the, the local guy. Um, there's a system, you know, a, a thing, a application called Pro Hoc Vici, which enables a lawyer from another jurisdiction to practice on a particular case mm -hmm. in, in that jurisdiction. So he su supported and sponsored me for that. And he was a good guy, an uh, older guy guy, um, kind of like the dean of the, the legal community. And I remember the night before we had to do these depositions, he was just really, you know, beating her up to try to get her to take a plea, just saying, you know, you, you you're going to go to prison for 10 years. What are you thinking? You can't do this, et cetera. Um, and I was more like, you know, let's, let's see what happens tomorrow. I, you know, I, I believe in her. So we show up the next morning and the prosecutor says, oh, I got bad news. 
I'm like, what's the problem? He goes, the snitch is not available. You know, he had a family issue. He, he can't come in. So we can reschedule. I'm like, reschedule. I, I flew and I drove. I'm in the middle mm -hmm. of the mountains here. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not. I, I, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, he's not available. Um, but the cop is here. But but he's not. I'm like, well, OK, then I'll come back. Uh, you know, I got a, a packed schedule. I got a lot of people who, who, who are calling my name. Um, I'll come back in two, three months. He goes, well, that's the problem, because if she doesn't decide on the plea in 30 days, it's withdrawn. That's our rule here. So um, you'd have to come back within 30 days. I'm like, I, I can't come back within 30 days. He goes, well, if she doesn't, then then you're going to trial and she's she's looking at the 10 years. So I had to decide those are the, the you know, when we talk about thinking on your feet, you mm -hmm. got to make those those split second decisions of what do you do in the best interest of, of this person. So I said, I, I felt pretty confident that that I had something that was of great value to her and could be expressed through this deposition that might get the case to go away. And so I said, you know what? Can you get him on the phone? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, we'll depose him by phone. Never did a phone deposition before. Yeah. I'm not sure many lawyers ever have, but that's the sort of creativity sometimes that, that's required. So uh, I get the, you know, so we're sitting there. First, I cross-examine the agent who admits that, yes, he gave him the money, yes, he searched him, but he didn't search his socks, he didn't search, he didn't search his pockets, and he let him drive his own car, and he didn't search the car. So in theory, that 10cc vial could have been secreted somewhere mm -hmm. prior to, to him going into the gym, but after he was searched by the, the agent. Yeah. Okay. And I find out that he was working off his own steroid trafficking case where he was given a deal where if he could set up three people, he would get a misdemeanor. And he had set up one, and that was like seven months earlier. So he was probably getting desperate to set somebody up. And if you, you know, wanted to set up somebody for steroids, you know, physically, mm -hmm. she appeared to be low-hanging fruit for yeah. that purpose, right? And I wasn't overly wild about the idea of going in front of a jury, you know, with her yeah. On, yeah. On, on the case, you know? Um, so, which, which also made me want to try to see if I could resolve it through this deposition. So, I get the guy on the phone and I'm asking him questions and he admits to all of those things. And then he says um, that you know, she gave him, basically, he went to the, the counter and she gave him the bottle of vitamins and inside was the vial. And I said to him, so, so you're saying that this bottle of vitamins contained the contraband that you were told to go in and get, right? Yes. And you understand that was the evidence in the case, right? That's the most important part of the case, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the essence of it. That's the important, that's the gold for you, right? And so you immediately took that bottle and brought it back to the police officer you were working with, right? Oh, yes. Because you wouldn't have gone anywhere else, right? No. You understand you want to have a direct link, right? Yeah. You understand the idea of chain of custody, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you ever hear of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you didn't go anywhere else, right? Really? Well, I did have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you went to the bathroom before you brought that bottle of vitamins, with that evidence that you're saying was inside it, you went to the bathroom before you went outside and gave it to the cop? Oh, well, yes. I had to go. I had to go. You had to go so badly that you couldn't wait just a few minutes until after you gave this precious, precious evidence to the, to the cop that you were working with? Oh, I had to go so bad. I had to go so bad. Number one or number two? He goes, number one. I go, okay, so you would, your bladder was so engorged that you could not wait. You had to go in there. Yes, and you did? Yes. So you went into the bathroom alone? Yes. You closed the door? Yes. Only you in that bathroom? Yes. What, he, what this knucklehead didn't realize was the tape was running the entire time. So I heard his transaction at the counter. I heard him go into the bathroom. I heard on the tape him closing the door, locking the door, taking his keys and putting them on the sink. You could hear it. I heard him with the cellophane 
of the bottle as you hear the crinkling of cellophane and actually heard the tapping of the big multivitamin tablets as they hit the porcelain of the bowl as he scooped out enough to put that vial into the bottle to have room for it before he closed it up. What you didn't hear in that entire time was a single tinkle <laughs> of liquid. Nothing. So I, when I confronted him with this, he's like, well, I don't like the way this is going. I said, yeah, there's a name for what you've done. You know what it is? It's called perjury. That's what you've just done. Well, I, I, I want to talk to my lawyer. I go, you probably, I don't blame you. You probably <laughs> should. You're in a whole shitload of trouble, my friend. I, I, I mean, he hangs up the phone. I look over at the prosecutor. He's white as a sheet. He's looking at me. I go, well, he goes, um, <clears throat> would you take a misdemeanor? I said, no, no. I'll tell you how this is going to go. <laughs> You're going to drop all charges against this woman. And I'm going to try to convince her not to sue you, the cop, and your entire department. How is that? He goes, I could live with that. <laughs> and so that was the end of the case. And she be, she's, to this day, one of my dear friends uh, on social media. So many of my clients become my friends. Mm -hmm. I, I love her to pieces. She's always, you know, uh, we stay in touch. Um, and, but, you know... Another lawyer may not have may not have made those choices. Uh, that was a guy who was desperate to set somebody up, and and what a piece of shit to just yeah. set up a woman who did nothing nothing wrong because it was in his best interest. So um, you know, I've got I've had a lot of a, a lot of cases where uh, I'm just grateful to have been able to play a role in in sort of you know really redirecting the the rest of the course of somebody's life. What's the difference between a state and federal case? So, fed, the, the, the same facts can be either one. You know, um, federal drug cases are based on the idea of an interstate. There's got to be an yeah, interstate yeah, commerce that. component to it. And all drugs, you know, they don't come from steroids. Don't come yeah. from Ohio. So, right? that, so I would think that so would make it always. All, yeah. They're always, but. Typically, the feds have certain thresholds that unless it's a case where they're really looking at either getting a lot of money or getting a lot of prison time, they usually won't bother with it typically. So uh, there are situations where even if the DEA or the FDA federal agency is the investigating agency, a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor is like, oh, I'm going to pass. I'm not going to take it. So then it maybe gets dumped down mm -hmm. to the state. Um, obviously, if state agents are the ones if the police the situation where the phone call comes and the girlfriend shows all the steroids yeah. to you know to the local police well then it's going to stay a state case typically mm -hmm. um so part of it is who the investigating agency is and part of it is the size of the case mm -hmm. um and it, it, it whether you're better off being charged federally or state really depends a number of years ago i had a case in the state of virginia involving pro hormones with a a guy who was like a major pro hormone manufacturer back when it was still kind of in that gray area mm -hmm. of legality um and didn't really certainly didn't qualify under the then existing anabolic steroid control act and he was arrested by state agents who uh set who brought him to court and the judge set a million dollars bond on him a million dollars for pro hormones it was craziest thing i'd ever seen we wound up getting him out um the definition of a steroid under virginia law that existed at that time was was different than the definition federally and every state can have its own definitions yeah. and laws and so it, there was a question as to wh whether it, these were steroids under virginia law and my goal was given the aggressiveness they were talking about 20 years in prison just crazy stuff i wanted that case to go federal so uh i wound up just you know in in kind of a, a papering to death the the, the uh state 
uh, prosecutor and basically saying, look, you know, this, this is, this is a very niche kind of thing. This should be a federal case. I, you know, without, without saying it in those words, basically you're running over your head and, and why don't you, why don't you just, you know, send it over to the feds? They'll, they'll screw him anyway. I mean, it's, yeah. they're, they're going to, you know, it's a federal case. You, 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 you think this guy should go to prison so long, make, let the feds deal it, you know, like as if I was scared of that, you mm -hmm. know, but obviously I, I was baiting him. I wanted him to send it federally. It did go federally. And he wound up getting probation at the end of the day. So, um, so yeah, uh, state and federal, it, it depends. You know, typically in a in a cocaine or a heroin conspiracy, you'd rather be in a state court than a federal court. Typically, you're looking because the guidelines for those kind of cases can make your nose bleed, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but with steroids, it, it's it really can depend, and that's one of the one of the things that if you have a trained eye and experienced lawyer can make those assessments and and to some extent in in some cases you can actually maybe help it to go in one direction or another what came about with um like a couple of years ago with the telehealth mm -hmm. with the testosterone right w where is that or is it resolved or what what happened there yeah so the the a law was passed back in 2008 i guess uh that required um for telehealth essentially that there has to be a face to face mm -hmm. interaction um some sort of you know in person physical exam of the person evaluation of the person because a kid had gotten uh, opiates uh over the internet just basically ordered them from a clinic and uh, any overdose and he died and so congress passed a law really because of opiate addiction yeah. that because steroids are also scheduled applies to testosterone and so in order to do a testosterone prescription based on that law, you had to have some sort of in-person evaluation, some physical evaluation of it. Um, and that's probably good medicine anyway, yeah. I would guess, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. you know, you shouldn't be prescribing, you know, the argument, I guess, is, you know, you could have a, a testicular, some sort of testicular growth or, you know, prostate the size of a cantaloupe or something that yeah. maybe you, you'd want to think twice about certain medications. So um, that kind of was put on hold when the pandemic hit. And so under the national emergency, uh, it was suspended because we wanted people to be able to get medications, uh, even though they, they weren't allowed to leave their houses. And now I was yeah. in New York where, you know, everything was just put on on ice for a while. My gym, you know, I'm wearing the, the Bev's uh, sweatshirt here. Bev's was closed for five months. I was training in my basement, you know. So um, so it, so that that sort of moratorium, that kind of hiatus on the face-to-face, -face, the, you know, in-person evaluation uh, remains on hold. But DEA is evaluating evaluating how to deal with that. And, you know, I think in, in you know, we'll ultimately have a, they, they tried to come up with some new proposed way of, of addressing it that would have allowed in some situations like a, a, a two-way audio visual kind of uh, interaction would with, with certain bells and whistles be allowed to suffice for it. Um, that got a lot of resistance primarily from the uh, community of addiction specialists who, who said that really wouldn't work for people who really need to uh, be prescribed certain medications to get them off heavier medications. And so uh, right now that's, that's a, a moratorium. Um, when we 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 talked a little bit before about sort of will there ever be a time where you know is there any movement to remove yeah. testosterone from the controlled substances act and and the only thing that's come up in all these years um was a few years ago uh two uh, senators the two senators from massachusetts u.s senators uh, sent a letter to the biden administration uh asking them to remove testosterone from the controlled substances act uh, or to at least lower it to maybe schedule five instead of schedule three and the theory uh, to do that was the idea that the restrictions that apply to testosterone impact negatively the trans community of people who are born or assigned female at birth and are looking to become 
either men or more masculine along a non-binary spectrum, that um, that those people are being treated because of the restrictions on testosterone differently from the people who are assigned male at birth and looking to go in the yeah. other direction. You know, estrogen is not a controlled substance, and that's the that would be the the, the primary treatment for somebody who with gender dysphoria mm -hmm. who's looking to become more feminized in, when they're assigned male at birth. Why is it restricted in one direction and not the other? And there have been stories from the trans community, uh, from the LGBT community, that uh, about you know how um, lesser access is is negatively impacting uh, the trans community. And so it was really that was the focus. Now, if nothing really came of it, at least so far, um, whether that descheduling would be limited to that particular use or whether bodybuilders, you know, the bodybuilding world and, and the steroid using world were like, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. go trans. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, 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 got suddenly, you know, the strange bedfellows, you know, yeah. you've got these allies now. Um, but um, where that'll go, I don't know. But that's really the only um, way that uh, that I see right now that that somebody's advocating for a reduction in in the punishments or the the restrictions that apply from scheduling yeah. steroids. What are some of the things that are happening now? You know, as far as um, I think I saw one of your posts where um, I know there was a time period with my prescription I could only get the small vials instead of the big vial, which is stupid right. to me because it costs more to yes. make ten of those and it does that. It, it no doesn't make any sense. Right? Where's that come from? Yeah. So, um, so that I'm I'm in New York and I'm seeing those things in New York. So uh, New York likes to regulate and restrict. Yeah. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, uh, I don't think it's happening in some other states. Um, you know, New York just passed a law, as you probably know, that restricts the sale of either muscle building or weight loss dietary supplement products to you know, only people over the age of 18. So if you're under 18, you can't buy creatine. You can't buy something that's marketed for metabolism. You can't buy something that's a weight loss drug uh, or a weight product, loss supplement. Yeah. Um, you know, Protein is excluded, but if it's protein and creatine together, you you can't sell it, and that's both online to New York and in New York. So it's very restrictive law. So where's that come from? That comes from the idea that um, there are people who are uh, you know suffering from eating disorders, and that the these products either cause eating disorders or exacerbate eating disorders. And to me, it makes no sense. And yeah. the, the emperor has no clothes in this. But yeah. but there are there are advocates who are pushing that narrative very hard. You know, I was 16 years old and I was taking protein powders mm -hmm. and, you know, desiccated liver pills oh, back yeah. in the, the day, big ones, yeah. the big ones and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, I'm, you know, uh, I don't think there's any danger associated with creatine. It's one of the most heavily researched of all sports nutrition products. But, um, you know, there's pushback. I think there's a lawsuit that's been filed to try to stop the attorney general of New York from uh, from enforcing this. But, but New York is very restrictive. And so uh, New York also is the only state that made anabolic steroids schedule two. Everywhere else, federally and in every other state that ever scheduled it in the country, it's three, schedule three. And the schedule that you're in is correlated with the potential for abuse and dependency. So obviously, if it's schedule one, you can't even prescribe it. It's, got, yeah. it's you know, marijuana is still schedule one. But um, Schedule 5, well, there's some potential for abuse and dependency, but it's less than four. And so, you know, the, the abuse dependency potential seems to me to be not related to the geographic boundaries of a particular state. It's not like the people of New York yeah, yeah. are going to be much more addicted to steroids mm -hmm. than the people of Ohio. It, it, yeah. it's, it's absurd. But yet that's exactly what the New York legislature did. It looked at all the others and said, well, we're going we're gonna to restrict it more. And there's, so there's more record keeping, there's more reporting red tape and all of that in New York than there is anywhere else in the country. And so, yeah, I have heard that Two things are happening. You, you do see this, you know, some of the big chain pharmacies refusing to give out the 10 cc vial and instead giving the little, you know, one ml kind of where you have to go back every month for for it, it's absurd. Uh, but I'm also seeing doctors who are not urologists or endocrinologists suddenly pulling themselves out of the the prescribing of TRT. 
mm-hmm. um, and and we're trying to refer now because some of the big, you know, what's happening. You know, the old the old model of a doctor actually owning his or her own business is rapidly disappearing, and those practices are being bought up by these huge mm-hmm. hospital networks. And then you you're ultimately a doctor working, you're getting a salary and working for some big you know hospital group, and those hospital groups are now pressuring the doctors to get out of any of this TRT prescribing. You know, the FDA in 2019 put a black box warning on testosterone, saying that it's linked to cardiovascular, heart attacks, and stroke problems, you know. Um, And they based it on some studies, which if you read the studies and really digested the data, it's not there. Is some of this coming from the insurance companies? Because there's, I see a vast difference between private pay and insurance pay. Right. You know, so if if my physician is private pay, then he doesn't have to worry about the prior authorizations mm-hmm. and all the things that are associated with the insurance company. And then if my pharmacy is private pay, then it seems to me like there's less red tape. Yeah. You know, to be able to go that process compared to if, you know, I go to this doctor that is covered, you right. know, and then this pharmacy which is covered. There's the issues that you're talking about where it's that. There's, yeah, I, so. I think it is. I think that that's a component to it, but that's not, it's not exclusive to that because there are a lot of people who are private pay. Uh, insurance is not involved. And, you know, they, they now show up to just get their prescription at CVS or whatever. And CVS says, no, 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 we're, we're not giving you a 10 ml. Well, hmm. We're going to give you, you know, this this little thing, and you, yeah. we need you back here every month with a new hand, handwritten, you know, a new physical prescription. Why are people doing that? So a lot of people are now going to the TRT clinics mm-hmm. in Florida or Texas or states that are a little less regulatory, um, and you know there are issues with. Some of those as well, because some of those some of those clinics go too far. You mm-hmm. know, I've seen some of them prescribing different types of anabolics that uh, it might be hard to justify. Yeah. Um, you know, why does this person need Anavar? Yeah. You, mm-hmm. you know, his Anavar levels. It's Anavar replacement. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, or so, equipoise. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trembolone. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so you've so you've got that. Um, and that's problematic. And there's also, uh, you know, the whole peptide issue that that's come up, and BPC one five seven and TB five hundred, which, you know, if you're in the gym world, you know people who yeah. are who are regularly using these for different types of injuries, and many of them anecdotally will swear by it and say, "Yeah, my shoulder feels so much better." Uh, but there's not a lot of research on these things, and they're not FDA approved, which is sort of the the standard of safety and efficacy yeah. that that at least the government says you, know, you can't use something until it, it passes that, other than maybe certain things that the experimental that, that were allowed. But um, so where'd the push from that come from? You know to to make it scheduled. So, so BPC one five seven and and TB five hundred are not scheduled yeah. in any way. Those are you know they're just unapproved. Yeah. So then the question is, well, can doctors prescribe unapproved drugs? Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that FDA would say they can. Uh, I'm not sure that a state medical licensing board would say that they can, and I'm not sure that the medical malpractice premium you know, policy mm-hmm. that a doctor has would say that they can. I think if you if most doctors looked at their medical malpractice policies, they'd see that there's an exclusion that they're not covered if they're. Per- you know, you can't prescribe things that FDA didn't approve. So there's there's issues all there, potential lawsuit issues as well, even if there's not a criminal component of it. And, and you know, I'm not sure mm-hmm. on that. Um, but um, so but doctors are prescribing those things. Um, is it is it a bad thing? You know, well, doctors are taking some risks. The alternative, of course, is that there's also websites selling Mm -hmm. these same things with no doctor involved whatsoever, no screening, no monitoring, no supervision. It's just, you know, go online, go to this website and and get your your peptides sent to your house uh, and inject them. Um, And, you know, 
I'd, I'd rather have them in the hands of doctors. Than, well, there's no quality not, control either. None. Sure. It's, it's God only knows where they're coming from or, or what's in them. And I've represented a lot of, um, a lot of research chemical companies through the years, you know, which is by research chemical company. I, I mean, a guy who yeah. uh, gets peptides from a Asians from China um, and um, sets up a website and puts up some disclaimers that say for research purposes only. Um, and, you know, you go on the website and you click some boxes and you click a disclaimer that says, uh, I'm, I'm a researcher and I'm, I'm not using this for human consumption. And then they're sent to your house and, and those, those products sometimes come in vials where, uh, from Asia, where the, the Chinese supplier will send an email saying the, the yellow tops are BPC, the you know, blue tops are TB 500, you know, the, you know, gold tops are, you know, GHRP six, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, melanotan two is the silver top, whatever. And unfortunately, I've seen when FDA has gone after some of these cases, and, and I've represented a lot of clients, um, sometimes it's all wrong. You know, what you thought was the BPC was actually melanotan, what you thought was, and whether the Chinese manufacturer just mixed up the color tops or whatever. So when you say quality control, you know, you're injecting things from, you know, from somebody's kitchen who imported it. It's, you know, uh, I, I'd certainly rather have a doctor involved yeah. in, in this equation. Um, but, um, but these, these companies do wind up on the receiving end of indictments because it's ironic because I think the reason that that disclaimer exists of saying this is for research purposes, not for human consumption, is that the marketer recognizes that if you didn't say that and you're saying, hey, use this, um, it's a drug. You, you're not a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. You can't be, you know, dis distributing drugs without, you know, some uh, authority to do it. And so it's criminal to do that. So by saying it's for research, well, then it's not a drug, it's a chemical. And so you're you're not it's not for somebody to use to affect the structure or function of their bodies, which is the definition yeah. of a drug in the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And so uh, you're you're trying to it's it's this little loophole so that it's not a drug. The, the problem is that loophole is what is the basis for the charge by the government in these cases because the loophole in the eyes of the government is fraud. You're saying it's it's for um it's for chemical it's just a chemical for research, but you're selling it under circumstances that show that that's not true. You know, you're marketing it in on a bodybuilding forum, yeah. you're um shipping it to private residences and college dormitories, you're uh interacting with emails with people who call themselves young and jacked at mm -hmm. gmail.com. All of this shows this was a facade and you set this this disclaimer up to fool FDA into thinking it's something that it's not. And that's the theory by which these these cases are prosecuted. And I've handled a lot of them and there there are a lot of very unique issues, even though the charge is fraud cases. There's some very unique issues that make it different than any really any other fraud case that most lawyers handle. Um, so I wind up getting a lot of these cases, and I can I can I have a, a whole bag of tricks that, that I use in these cases, which are legitimate arguments, but um, which you know the prosecutors may really not have recognized or thought of. So I I, I come in with um, you know the more you've done something, the better you get at it, and the more mm -hmm. you like what you do, the better you're going to get at it. And I've gotten very very good at these these sorts of cases with a gray area. If it's an online coach. You know, that's speaking to somebody and they're talking about their cycle. Right. You know, that's, that's gray as hell, right? Because yeah. it's, where, where does the First Amendment end and, yeah. and where does, yeah. you know, criminal conduct begin? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, the devil's in the details, you know, certainly just saying things typically with some limited ex exceptions uh, is protected by the First Amendment. Um, 
once it's monetized in some way, that's a step toward, you know, it, it being more of a, a, a criminal thing, um, you know, uh, certainly providing uh, information. So here's where you go to get it. Well, okay, you know, I I use TB five hundred, and you know, I don't sell it, but you know, Jimmy does, and here's his his address. Well, at some point, you become a co-conspirator to Jimmy, right? You're mm-hmm. an aider and a better of, of Jimmy's, you know, conduct. So um, the devil's in the details, but um, you know, it, it it's typically got to be more than just, hey, you know. TB500 is good and, uh, you know, you may want to consider using it. That's probably protected by, by the First Amendment. Um, you know, how far, how far we go in, in protecting the First Amendment is, is an interesting uh, issue. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you've heard of the case of uh, Missouri versus Biden. Um, but there's a link on my Instagram and, and there's links. If you go to my, my bio on Instagram, you, you'll come up with a link tree of, of various things that I've written podcasts I've done. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure this podcast yeah. will be up there at some point. And, um, uh, it was a case where a, a few state attorneys general sued the administration because uh, under the, the claim that the administration was impacting the First Amendment and was having a chilling effect on the First Amendment, not directly, but by cracking down on social media platforms and influencing the social media platforms to either cancel people's accounts or to uh, shadow ban people who were maybe talking about certain narratives that the Mm -hmm. government didn't like, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, And uh, it went to court and and the decisions, uh, there's an article, my take on it is on my bio, and I put links to the actual court decisions so people could read them for Mm -hmm. themselves and make their own mind up about um, you know, whether there was overreaching or not, or whether the, you know, some of the agencies that were involved acted appropriately. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of censorship in any way, shape or form typically. Um, yeah, you know, certainly there are some that you can't, you can't scream fire in a crowded theater. I mean, we can go over, you know, where speech transcends legality and where we need to stop certain speech. But by and large, I, I think, the way that you battle misinformation or, or, you know, false information is to rebut it with truthful information. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what we found, I think, over the last few years is that some things that were called misinformation have turned out not to have been misinformation. Mm-hmm. And what was purportedly information turned out to be the misinformation yeah. uh, in some cases. And so um, I think... Having robust debate, having you know, if, if, rather than suppressing bad ideas, we we rebut them with good ideas, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and you, you're seeing this play out on on college campuses now to a degree too, where there's this mentality that if I don't agree with a particular narrative or a particular speaker's ideology, uh, the way I deal with it is to ban him from the campus, to stop him, to, to protest, you know, to try to, to get him canceled so that he can't speak. So I won't hear what he has to say. And I think that's a very dangerous thing. I think, yeah. you know, we, we need to hear what people who have different ideas than we have, have to say, we, we have to listen and we may not agree with it. We mm-hmm. may say, you know what, I, I don't buy that. Um, you know, I'm going to continue to believe what, what I believe or, you know, I, I think there's a great value to just being open to, um, always, always being open to the possibility that, you know what, maybe I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's, there's another way of looking at this. Maybe, you know, maybe you're not a bad person, even if I don't dis- agree with, yeah, with what yeah. you have to say. And we're kind of losing that as a society. So I've written a lot about this stuff over mm-hmm. the last few years. You know, I, um, um, I've got a few little topic areas that I, I talk about in some of the podcasts I've done that you've probably seen, um, whether it's, uh, 
you know, this, this, you know, censorship and, and freedom of speech issue, um, or whether it's, you know, sort of the safe space issue. Uh, I've written and, and spoken a lot about that. Um, I'm not, I'm not a fan of safe spaces. I think nothing good happens. Nothing grows in a safe space. Well, echo chambers. Well, yeah, sure. You, you just, you just uh, are confronted with nothing other than what you already believe. So you're never challenged and you're coddled so that you never hear anything that uh, is in any way um, different than what you're comfortable with. And as that happens, I think you you, you become less and less resilient and, and weaker and more fragile. There's this, this myth, I think, of fragility. You could either mm -hmm. look at it, either we're inherently resilient or we're inherently fragile. And I think we're now in a a, a national narrative where where we we've come to believe that we're inherently fragile, so we need to be protected uh, by the government, typically or or others, to prevent us from hearing anything, from seeing anything. Or it's it's like you know metaphorically wearing helmets all all day in case we're exposed to something that might trigger us uh, or upset us or offend us. And uh, I think that's a a bad place to be. I think the the, you, you know, a friend of mine is uh, says that the military has a saying that you need to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and discomfort is how you grow. And, and I always make the analogy to bodybuilding, right? I mean, how do you grow? How do you improve? You subject yourself to stress. And the higher the level of stress to a point is what causes the adaptive response to the growth, right? Yes. It, it's to the challenge. So that, that's how you grow. So if you go to the gym and, you know, uh, this wonderful facility that we're in right now, uh, and, you, and you do those 10 reps at that weight, and you never do an 11th rep, you never go beyond. Um, at some point, it gets comfortable to do the 10 reps, but you're never going to grow from that. You know, you're yeah. only going to grow when you do that 11th rep and that 12th rep. And those are going to be the ones that are painful. Those are the ones that are going to cause the greatest stress. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to like it. You're going to be in pain. And but but from that pain, from that stress, from that discomfort, that's where the adaptive response comes. That's where you grow. And if you never subject yourself to that, whether it's in the gym or in college or anywhere that you are, you never subject yourself to that stress. Um, you're never going to grow. I think adversity and struggle is where growth comes from. That's what makes you, that's what builds your character the way that those 11th and 12th reps yeah. build your biceps. Well, I don't, I don't really know anybody that disagrees with that. You know, it's, well, I, you know, I live uh, in a bubble, I, go to yeah. a college campus, Yeah, go, go to a college campus today. Um, I, I think we've gone in a, a very different direction. Um, even on law in law schools, you may have seen, you know, there was a, a law school where uh, a speaker, was a judge and he was uh, shouted down by a law school class. These are going to be the future, you know, the future of my profession who shouted him down because they didn't, they, they felt unsafe by his political ideology. That's a dangerous place to be. You know, I, I we grew up in an age where feeling unsafe was restricted to physical issues, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I'm on the edge of a cliff and I'm looking down yeah. Yeah. thousands of feet. And if I lean forward too far, I'm going to fall. I don't feel safe. Okay. That's great. Um, but if I don't feel safe, just because you're saying an idea that is different from what I've been indoctrinated to believe, that's a problem. And I think, you know, we're all in our bubbles, but, mm -hmm. but that is going on, you know, whether you're, whether you see it here, um, out in the hinterlands of, yeah. of Ohio or not. Do you see a pushback against it? I do. I think there's, there's now kind of a pushback going on and, and I think it's, it's super important how long it's going to take to get there. I don't know. Um, but I, I think we have to push back at least, uh, to recognize that we've gone too far in safetyism. And, you know, it, it's risk and it's, it's, you know, challenge, you know, I, I always say I'm a better bodybuilder. I'm a better lawyer for having been a bodybuilder um, because, you know, bodybuilding teaches those, those lessons uh, where, you know, 
struggle and adversity and pain is is what makes you grow and get better and you've got to be willing to do it determination and perseverance and overcoming the obstacles of injuries we, and we yeah. all had them we were i was kidding around with you before that there's a meme uh, on mm -hmm. social media yeah. where it's a uh, a picture of different joints on fire mm -hmm. like the you know red heat all around the knee and the lower back and it says what the predator sees when it when he chases me mm -hmm. right i mean we, we years of, of heavy lifting you know you you pay the price but but that's what made you grow and that's that's how you you, you developed and i think that's that's super important a couple of years ago um i i was on my roof cleaning the some gutters or something and uh, for the first time i felt a little queasy about the height uh, looking down and i'd never had an issue with heights before and so i, I had to make a decision of, of what do i do and and certainly one option is to never put yourself in a position where yeah. you know you're subjected to to that uh, but the other alternative is the the alternative that i chose which was i set up a charity skydive and I jumped out of a plane at 13,500 feet um, because I was terrified to do it. But I, to me, that was a way of, of confronting that limitation or that weakness mm -hmm. and, and overcoming it and, you know, you know eating it, you know, and, and absorbing it. And I've done since done five skydives. I've got a USPA skydiver's license. I, I want to recertify and and actually do some solo jumps and all. But um, the the reality is, you, you've got to challenge yourself like that. I mean, whatever whatever scares you is what you should do. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing to do. Not the not the stuff that doesn't scare you. But um, but I, I speak a lot about this sort of stuff as yeah. well in my in my I, I wrote a book uh, with a co-author a few years ago called Alpha Male Challenge and it's available on on Amazon mm -hmm. and stuff and it's a it's a training book uh, it's diet it's exercise not not a powerlifters book mm -hmm. or a bodybuilders book but for for guys looking to get their mojo back uh, thirty and and over really just trying to you know reclaim their best selves and there's a whole section on attitude uh, and, and sort of like alpha. attitude attitude and, and alpha male being defined uh as as being your best without being an asshole yeah right? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you yeah. know um and and a lot of the book is uh, the attitude aspect of the book is based on the idea that you need to challenge yourself you need to confront what what scares you and and that will make you better and it's very empowering i, I don't know if you've ever done a skydive but it's incredibly empowering, and the more afraid you are to do it, <laughs> yeah. the, the more you get out of it. Because you know, statistically, you're going to be fine. It's, yeah. you, you, you know, it's 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 safer than driving in, mm -hmm. in many instances. But subjectively, you know, when you look out and you see the curve of the Earth, and and you know, there's literally nothing but empty air between you and you know a couple miles down the, the ground, and you just sort of rock out of that airplane into the abyss. It is a um, uh, it, it's it's an experience that when you land and you land safely and you will land safely um it feels as if you've kicked death in the nuts it feels like you have mm -hmm. you have dared the fates you have you know knocked death down there's, there's almost like a you know an, an immortality uh, of empowerment that is um like nothing you you, you, you can, and the more afraid you you are of it the more you get out of yeah. it and the more empowering it is because i have friends who've done skydives they're adrenaline junkies they, they do the first skydive and it's like yeah man let's do that again mm -hmm. it was like no no real big deal but it's the person who's absolutely terrified to do it who is you know um shaking in their boots about the idea of it and then does it and you know survives it which they will um that really comes to think you know i never thought i could do that and i did it I found the part of me to be able to do that. What else can I do? What other self-imposed limitations are holding me back? What else can I challenge myself with that will will broaden me and strengthen me um, in in all aspects of my life? So I recommend you know do whether mm -hmm. it's that or, or other ways of challenging yourself. Were there any topics you wanted to cover I didn't bring up? Um, how long have we gone, man? I have no idea. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, 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 we've gone two hours. Um, so, uh, no, I, I mean, uh, I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, I, 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 we could talk more about some cases I've had. We can talk about, um, you know, um, 
more philosophy or, or empowerment stuff. Um, one of the fun cases I had a few years ago that I've told this story and you may have heard it is that, um, uh, I had a guy, a New York, uh, guy who had gone to Mexico and driven his car down there as a school teacher. And he drove down there to, um, to get some steroids for him and his gym buddies and put them in the trunk of his car. He's coming back. I think he was coming through, um, Alabama, uh, on what was probably a, a high drug trafficking highway for mm -hmm. not steroids, but for, you know, so trooper sees the car, sees New York plates. He's pulled over. Trooper says to the guy, uh, you know, uh, where are you coming from? Oh, I'm coming from Mexico and had a little party down there. So some friends and, um, you know, and I'm on my, on my way back. Okay. Um, you mind popping open the trunk? So he's a school teacher, educated guy, you know, smart guy. Who knows the law to a degree and says, you know what? I have nothing to declare. I, I haven't done anything wrong, but yeah, I, I'm going to stand on my rights. I'm I'm not consenting to you opening the trunk of my car. Trooper says, "Really? Says, okay. Well, um, tell you what, um, I'm going to call up the canine unit, and we're going to get the canine unit here, and the dog's going to sniff, and if the dog finds something in your trunk." going to be a big problem because that dog is mean, mean, mean dog. And that dog will scratch up all your pain. I, I, we barely can contain it. Could could even, uh, I'm going to try to keep you away, but it could bite you. Could could get you, you know. You sure you don't want let me in that trunk? He's like, yeah, I'm quite sure. I'm not consenting to you going in the trunk. Okay. So calls up the canine unit. They're waiting like 20 minutes. One or two times he comes over to the guy and, and tries again to say, listen, you know, it could be, I don't know how far, it could be hours. I don't want to keep you here. Just open the trunk and, and let me see what's in there. Of course, that's where the steroids mm -hmm. are. He says no. Finally, the, the canine unit comes. Handler comes there. You know, this, this crazy, angry dog that's going to scratch up all the paint and destroy the car. Uh, walks around the car once twice and just sits down doesn't do anything else the trooper goes over to the canine unit and, and the teacher overhears a piece of the conversation where the handler for the canine unit says we ain't got shit trooper walks over to the teacher and says it's a hit he says it's a hit. He goes, no, no, no. He said we ain't got shit. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it's a hit. He said shit, not hit. He goes, no, 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 no. He said hit. Open the trunk. Pops open the trunk, and lo and behold, there's steroids. There's a lot of winstrol, as I remember, in, in there. And so um, the guy gets charged, and uh, the case winds up going to trial. Crazy situation. And... Um, they the issue becomes well you know did they have a right to open the trunk and was the dog reliably trained on steroids and i remember this was a number of years ago i called every canine handler i could find nationwide and i could not find anyone who had ever trained a dog to determine you know to to find a hit on a, an anabolic steroid mm -hmm. of any kind yeah um and some said it was theoretically possible, I guess, but but nobody had ever done it. And when I had asked for the discovery on this case, it, you know, their training manual um, on for the dog was with respect to steroids was one handwritten word winstrel. They just wrote on there, oh, which which certainly looked yeah. very suspicious. And, and it wound up at the end of the day, uh, he was exonerated. Um, but but it just goes to show, even if you do enforce your you know what what your best interests are in terms of a search and and you know not consenting to an un, to a warrantless search. Um, you know, that's not necessarily the way that it can end. And that's where a good lawyer can come in and, and make a difference. Mm -hmm. What's the best way people can find you? 
So I'm pretty, I'm pretty accessible. You know, um, I, uh, I've got a website at rickcollins.com and, and that talks about sort of the federal cases and the federal system, even though I do a lot of state cases too, but I do a lot of federal work. Most of my work is probably federal now because those are the bigger cases. So rickcollins.com is an easy one. Uh, many years ago, um, I wrote a book called Legal Muscle, mm-hmm. which, um, you know, uh, there are still some copies floating around like somewhere on, yeah, yeah, on yeah. eBay or mm-hmm. something. They usually overcharge like ridiculous amounts for them. Um, and then that led to my writing a column for Muscular Development Magazine, which I wrote for well over 20 years. Um, and uh, at some point wrote, um, you know, uh, Legal Muscle uh, while that was going on and and opened a, uh, started a website called Steroid Law. Dot com and that's still there and it's just a little information about steroids and the law um which so those are the websites uh i'd say i'm probably most active on instagram and so people can go to rick collins esq and just follow me on instagram and i try to post uh, today i actually posted a chart that i made of how the steroid unit guidelines are calculated which i you know mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't exist anyway i i made the chart um it, it's probably useful to to lawyers who handle these anybody else who tried to handle a case like this um but also for people to know um so i, I try to post there's some personal stuff and some of my lifting stuff. I still lift, you know, um, I train hard. I think anybody who, who knows me from, from Bev's will tell you that I'm, I'm one of the regulars. I want to meet that always. I think, I think so. (laughs) Yeah. You know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I love, I love sort of those two pieces. You know, I, I, I have one foot in the legal community. I was the president of the, one of the largest suburban bar associations in the country. Um, I'm very, active in in the New York State Bar Association and in the American Bar Association. I'm part of committees and task forces in in both of those. So I I walk in sort of the professional world of lawyers, but I'm also, um, and and I thought about, well, if you've seen most of my podcasts, I'm usually wearing either a sport jacket or something like that. No, I love that you wore this. (laughs) (laughs) And I said to myself, well, I'm I'm in this this incredible Mm -hmm. facility, this gym facility that Dave Tate has has created here. Um, I'm not going to show up in a in a sport jacket and and people who people who know who I am they know my shtick I, I, I this is the way I dress five days a week when I walk into the gym um, and and I I love that I'm in that world too and continue to be part of the bodybuilding world um, I I've you know I never thought you know circling back that when I kind of finished my competitive bodybuilding career and started my legal career that somehow those two completely disparate you know environments would somehow merge into one single professional um you know identity where you know as as sort of like the bodybuilding lawyer Mm -hmm. where i was because nobody had ever really done it before uh there was a lawyer many years ago called clarence bass if you remember Mm -hmm. him he had a column in like uh, muscle and fitness back in the day but um you know timing it just worked that the year that i went into private practice was the year that steroids were criminalized and suddenly the the guys in the gyms from the 80s were now federal drug criminals (laughs) and so i started getting phone calls and people asking me well what what you know how do I how do I understand what's happening in the courts? And then, of course, the, the people in the courts had no clue about what mm-hmm. was happening in the gyms. So I became sort of the go between, the bridge of information to those two things. And it's been an incredible ride. You know, I've represented a lot of sports nutrition companies. I represented Sylvester Stallone's company in Stone back in the day. Mm-hmm. That was a great experience. I did a lot of work with Ben Weeder for the IFBB back in the day. Also great. Um, you know, I worked with a, a lot of the, the sports nutrition um, pro hormone companies, uh, represented many of them in criminal f- capacities after the, the government started to crack down on that. I've got I got some time to. Uh, to spend with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his his office uh, in um, above Shotzi on Maine, mm-hmm. you know, in Santa Monica. You'll work with companies too in the supplement industry to prevent issues. Yes. So I'd I'd say you know uh, I, part of my practice is the preventive, the regulatory, sort of keeping people out of trouble. Yeah. 
And then the other part, which is probably the more lucrative part, mm -hmm. you know, is getting people out of the trouble that they are in either because they didn't call me for advice or you know, <laughs> didn't know me or whatever. And now they find themselves in a situation. And I, I, I enjoy both, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I like keeping keeping people out of trouble is, is a, a great thing. And uh, I represent a lot of good sports nutrition companies that are doing the right thing. Even though we see on the news, supplements are unregulated and there's all these attacks on the dietary supplement community, especially the, the sports nutrition market. Um, so I feel good about doing that sort of that sort of work um but it but i love and, and it's super rewarding to have somebody who's you know who i can really make a major difference because they were looking at uh, you know what what for many people is the worst the worst thing that's happened to them certainly mm -hmm. professionally uh, in their lives it's like a, a terrible medical diagnosis you've got a state or sometimes the feds who now want to want to put you if the feds come after you they're not coming after you because they want to give you probation typically mm -hmm. they're coming after you because they they want money and and jail and all of those things and to to be able to be the defender of that person um to to try to be the you know the barrier between what the the government wants to do to people um and you know look if if everybody were to be judged only on the one the bad thing that they did in their life and not all those other things, you know, it, it's, that's, that's unfair. And as criminal defense lawyers, what, what we mm -hmm. have to do is, is try to get a judge or a prosecutor to recognize that you can't be summed up by the one stupid, you know, thing that you did. I mean, even if it's a, even if it was monetarily based or whatever it is. And so, um, so I feel very good about that. Um, and like I said before, uh, a, a lot of my clients, the people who call me, you can go to look at some of my reviews and testimonials. And I, I love that because people really uh, appreciate, you know, the work that I do for them. Um, I've made this huge difference in people's lives. And and to me, that's, that's, that's um, keeps me going, gets me up in the morning. I love getting up on a Monday morning. <laughs> I love going to work. And there aren't a lot of lawyers, you know, who feel that way. There are some who are kind of unhappy. Um, and that's unfortunate doctors too. Um, but I love what I do, Dave. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for coming out. This has been a pleasure. Um, guys, thanks for listening and we're done. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew. Would I join again? Absolutely. And I will continue to be a member of the Discord group as long as it's active. I've been a big fan of Table Talk over the last couple of years. It's one of my top podcasts that I listen to. So once Dave Tate announced that there would be a Discord crew. It was a no-brainer for me to join. It's been overwhelmingly positive experience. One of the biggest benefits of being in the Discord crew form checks. I work out in my garage by myself. I don't have people to cue me, to correct me, to coach me, anything like that. So being able to hop on the Discord post my videos and having elite top level power lifters and coaches able to give me real time feedback that, hey man, you need to tweak this, you need to work on this, do some more accessories here has been a huge, huge benefit. I've seen my progression as a lifter make jumps just because of that. There's so much info on the sport group for the members, thousands of articles, tons of eBooks. And really the best thing about it, it's like you're back in the gym, you're busting other people's balls sometimes. At the same time, you're getting really good information. It's been a blessing for me this last year and I really recommend it. All right, guys, we got new limited edition apparel. There's two designs, as with all the limited edition apparel. It's only while supplies last. This is the blue illusion tee, so I guess you can act like you're stronger than you really are. It's an illusion. And the other one, work harder, not lazier. Or you could just work really, really hard at being lazy. Doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is that you support the podcast. So hit the link in the description or go to EliteFTS.com. And on the homepage, scroll down, you're going to see limited edition apparel. Click on there. Pick up your limited edition apparel today. Help support the podcast, podcast, podcast. Thank you.